Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today we have a returning guest, Bill Holter. He is a financial writer, gold expert. He collaborates with Jim Zaclair on jsmindset.com, and I really appreciate him coming back. Welcome back to the Spotlight, Bill. Happy to be here, Dave. Thanks. Hey, thanks for coming on again. And I mean, last time we spoke, a lot of things were happening. And since I think it was back in August, we spoke last. I mean, so much has happened now. I mean, the Fed, I mean, raised interest rates um, into a weak economy. I mean, (coughs) are they I mean, is this telling us that we have recovered and everything is fine now? That's what they're trying to tell us. But it's obvious if you look at the just look at the economic numbers that have been coming out over the last month or two months. They've, on balance, been quite weak. Uh, the last time, the last time we had uh, economic numbers like this, we had spreads blowing out, junk bonds falling apart. The Fed lowered rates back in two thousand and eight. There's just there's no justification in the real world why the Fed would raise rates. And there's two schools of thought. One is they're they're trying to uh, create some credibility, and the other school of thought is they're pulling the plug. So when you say pulling the plug, are you saying they're setting up the economy to collapse or or to completely crash? Well, there's no there is no reason. There's no rational reason to raise interest rates onto an economy that's weak. I have written uh, and still of the belief that there would be some type of something to point at, some type of false flag that the Fed would, would then say, our policies were working, things were getting better. If it wasn't for such and such, our policies would have worked. And does that mean they have to, they're going to have to turn around and, and create a QE4? I think they're going to have to ease pretty quickly because I would expect the financial markets to unravel pretty quickly. You're already seeing, like I said, junk bonds are falling apart. Uh, the TED spread now is, is starting to blow out. Uh, you're, you're starting, you're seeing signs of, stress in the financial system and they can't let this go very long if they do you'll see it online really quickly so as i said i i think keep an eye out for some type of of false flag event that can be pointed at and blamed Uh, actually i agree with you and I, i noticed the fed when they came out with the interest rate hike they said they were going to do this you know maybe multiple times during 2016 and to fit into what you're saying and i've said this before also is maybe they raised it this time to show like hey look we're in a recovery look what we did we're able to raise it by you know 0.25 percent everything's great and then maybe when they're going for the next rate hike what you're talking about a false flag hits and they can say oh whoa look see we were in a recovery and this came and it, you know, it did whatever it did to bring the economy down. Is, I mean, does that, that kind of fits into what you're saying here? Yes, it does. And before going any further, we're still using the word recovery. Yeah. We're now seven years into recovery. Some, if you go back in time, the business cycle typically was four years, five years, something like that. And the recovery phase coming out of a recession was six months or a year. And and then the word or the, the catchphrase would change. It would become growth. You're not hearing the word growth. You're hearing recovery. Recovery for seven or eight years. The, the point being... We, we've, we're not, we've not gotten to the growth phase. And that's with their pet with their foot to the floor on the pedal of monetary and fiscal policy. There is no escape velocity, and there's not going to be any escape velocity. We're we're in a debt trap. We've reached debt saturation, and we've done that a- across the the Western globe. 
and we can see the government by them spent um, passing the spending bill that's not going to help with the debt problem whatsoever and we're seeing a lot of other economic indicators that are showing us that this economy does not look like it's like you said in in any type of uh, recovery but we shouldn't even use the word recovery it's not even strong the economy at this point from everything that we've been seeing well, this uh, this spending bill was an increase of about 6.6 percent but yet they tell us there's no inflation it, that doesn't add up I just had breakfast this morning with a with a veteran on Social Security and he didn't get one penny raise on either his uh, Social Security or veterans benefits so on one hand there's no inflation on the other hand they just increased the budget 6.6 percent they're they're spending us into the ditch that's true what what other economic indicators are you seeing that this economy is continually declining and not improving whatsoever well, take take the obvious take trade uh, if you look at and this is on a global basis if you take trade trade is collapsing it's collapsing across the globe. The price of of moving goods, like the Baltic Dry Index, that's lower than any time since it was created in 1986. Take unemployment. We have, what, 94, 96 million people that are, quote, out of the workforce. They're, they're not looking for jobs. If you put those, those people, even if you put half of those people back in, in and said that yeah they would like a job if they could find one you're at double digit unemployment rates john williams calculates i think the number 17 over 17 percent unemployment so the five percent unemployment is is complete bull so i mean since the fed decided to raise interest rates what other effects on the economy are we going to see i mean are we going to see problems in the housing market? Are we going to see problems in auto loan sales? Are we going to see problems um, with the banking system? I mean, I mean, is gold going to be moving up or down because of this? What do you see occurring because of what they've done? Because of the quarter point. Yeah. I, I don't think it's going to make such a big difference from an economic standpoint. I, I think... From a financial standpoint, if they actually do uh, tighten credit conditions to create the quarter point, then you're going to see problems from a financial, from a banking sector standpoint. Uh, you mentioned auto, the auto industry. The auto industry, uh, look what they're sitting on. They're sitting on a trillion dollar uh, auto loan time bond. And that's pulled all sorts of forward set or in the future sales into today. Just today, you had existing home sales down 10.5% in November. And you certainly can't say that that was weather related because November and December have been just incredibly good weather across the United States. So, what do you think is happening? I mean, they're keep. They, I mean, they're telling us that home prices, which doesn't make any sense to me. They're telling me they're telling us that home prices are continually increasing, but we see existing home sales decreasing. Right. So something is wrong here. Something doesn't add up. You're also starting to see the the volume of home sales drop, not just the price, but the volume. The the if you go back to say 2006, 2007, the home price still continued higher for a few months after the volume slowed down. And you see that in any market. You see that in the stock market. You see that in commodities markets. You can see the price continue higher or level off, but the volume contract. And you're starting to see volume contract. In particular, I think uh, last week I saw the volume in the San Francisco area dropped a big double digit number maybe up to 20 percent once volume goes away then price follows and I think that's what you're looking at in the in the housing sector is that you're going to see lower prices follow the lesser volume of or the lesser turnover now last time we spoke you talked about um, the US becoming a third world 
nation. And what's very interesting when you said that and you looked into the TPP, there was a certain section in there which allowed corporations to bring in foreign workers into this, they can bring them into this country and they can pay them at their country's wage. And it's funny because I was putting what you said to what was in the TPP and it adds up that yes, this would become a third world type of nation. The, the point being, you would have Americans that have a minimum wage would have to compete with uh, with lower paid workers. So it, it undercuts, it guts the system even further. Uh, since then, we've had uh, China join the IMF. Mm -hmm. That makes the yuan a or one of the reserve currencies. Uh, also, in the the uh, spending bill that was passed, they finally, from 2010, uh, Congress had been stonewalling, elevating the uh, elevating the BRICS within the IMF, and they passed that. That's part of the bill. So we turned back on that, and the biggest news. I think we're going to look back and see that the the biggest news last week was not the Fed raising interest rates. The biggest news was John Kerry meeting with Lavrov and Putin going into the meeting saying Assad must go and coming out of the meeting saying Assad does not have to go. And on top of that, uh, Turkey was ordered to pull their uh, pull troops out of northern Iraq, which Erdogan since then has said, no, we're not going to do it. But think about it, going back to 1945. When has any ally ever publicly said we're not going to do anything? And when has the U.S. ever gone into a meeting with one mind and come out with another mind? So do you think at this point they spent, well, let's think about this for a sec. In Syria, they spent, what, billions of dollars in Syria all they've been saying for the last, I don't know, what is it, six, seven years or whatever it is, saying that Assad must go. Well, since 2013, they've been been public. Yeah. That Assad must go. Right. Or 2011, I guess it was. Yeah. So, and now all of a sudden, they're doing an about face. Do you think that's it with Syria? They're done? We're just, the, the U.S. government is no. just going to say, okay, let's just leave here. Russia can handle the Islamic State. No. no. Um, something happened. Something happened in that meeting. Uh, if you go back to, if you go back last year, you'll remember that the Donald Cook was buzzed by a Russian MIG, and there's reports that the Aegis system was shut down. And right afterwards, the Donald Cook left the Black Sea. Now, is it something technological? Could be. Uh, is it something financial? Did Russia relay to John Kerry that, that if, if we continued to, to push bad policy, China was going to dump their treasuries? That's possible. I don't know what happened. I wasn't at the meeting. There's not been any reports. But something big, very big, happened. Something as big or bigger than anything that's happened in 70 years since World War II. Because, like I said, this is the first time the U.S. has gone into a diplomatic meeting and backed down. So what do you think they have planned next then? If you don't think that they're just going to leave Syria at this point, do you think, you know, do they have another plan that they're coming up with? I have no idea. Uh, we've not said that we're going to pull out. Uh, Putin did announce a no-fly zone after the meeting throughout northern Syria, I believe. And since then, the, the British have said uh, that they're going to send some troops. It's This is above my pay grade. I, I can't even speculate what the U.S. is going to do from here. All I, know is I, all I know is what I see, and the U.S. backed down, so something really big changed. I don't have a crystal ball. I, I can't tell you. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. So 
let me, I mean, we have the economy and we have what's going on in the Middle East. And we understand that our economy is driven mostly by the petrodollar um, in the right. Middle East. And we see there's huge fighting in Yemen. We see Libya, they just came up with this unified government type of peace deal, which I don't know if that's really going to work out or not. Um, we have Lebanon, they're still fighting in Lebanon. Iraq does not want the U.S. inside their country. They're telling Turkey to get out. And then the U.S. back down in Syria. Um, what happens to the petrodollar at this point? Because it seems like the Middle East is a complete mess. Well, the Middle East is a complete mess. I think your, your question on the petrodollar, you need to look at, you need to look at what's happening. Russia is setting up an oil exchange. It will not be settled in dollars. China, the oil that they're consuming, they trade with uh, Russia for oil. That will not be settled in dollars. I suspect that the Saudi Arabian oil that goes to China will not be settled in dollars. The only thing that you can take from this is that the petrodollar is being weakened from a uh, from a flow standpoint. The petrodollar is also being weakened from a geopolitical standpoint because we just lost clout last week with the with the backing down of, of US policy in the Middle East. So if the petrodollar is being weakened, um, what does that mean for the United States? Because if less countries are using the dollar to purchase the oil, what effect does it have here in the United States? Just think back, what, what has been the, the, the two big strengths of the U.S.? The military and the fact that the, we have the world reserve currency, the petrodollar, we're able to issue, being the world's reserve currency, we've been able to issue unlimited amounts of credit, mm -hmm. unlimited amounts of debt. What that basically tells me is that, yeah, in fact, there is a limit to our credit card. You know, there is a top to the credit card. And, and actually, I think we've hit that because if you look, uh, actually, well, I think uh, over the last year the the amount of of u.s treasuries that china holds is actually down mm. and they were our banker i mean they they bought up over three trillion worth of treasuries and now all of a sudden they stopped a couple of years ago and they're starting to unwind that position that's really bad i mean who's gonna who's gonna take up the slack the fed that's outright straight monetization so if China is dumping the treasuries, and I think there's a, a, um, a other countries that are also, I know Russia has dumped uh, a lot of their treasuries. And I know actually Japan has been um, dumping some of theirs. Um, if I don't they, think China's dumping. I think China has just uh, drastically pulled back on what they're buying. Just pulled back? Uh, I, I mean, if, I mean, when we look at this, I mean, do you, I mean, a lot of people are saying this, that things are moving from west to east. Absolutely. I mean, because we see China and Russia, they're setting up their own payment systems. Right. The yuan, like you said, the IMF gave the green light um, for that. They're making China's making bilateral trades. They're opening up clearing houses. All I mean, everything is moving from what was normally based in the West, and it seems like they're making a duplicate copy out in the East. Right. China actually, uh, and I'm not sure if it's January first or not, but China is going to implement their own gold fix similar to the London gold fix. The only difference being their gold fix is going to be based on on physical trades mm -hmm. as opposed to paper trades. And while we're on the subject, you know that the LBMA has been in backwardation for the most part of the last uh, three to four months. And COMEX just last week went into backwardation as of yesterday you had the spot month, December, about a dollar higher going all the way out to June. So you finally have backwardation in COMEX, which is, I kind of never expected it on COMEX because it's, in my mind, it's paper. 
it's a, a paper game. But you've got this month of December where, call it, there's 200,000 ounces of gold that are standing, a couple hundred ounce, a couple hundred thousand ounces of gold uh, that they they have available to, to deliver. And I think they just took in, uh, I think it was 40,000 ounces or something like that. That's the first entry into the COMEX so far this month. So you're basically looking at the amount standing is equal to the amount that they have to deliver. Going one step further, uh, well, let me explain backwardation first. Backwardation is where you get the first, the front month, the spot price equal to or higher than future months. And that could happen in sugar or it could happen in cattle or oil or what have you because of of delivery problems or the weather or what have you you cannot have that in gold you can't have that in gold because gold is money and an ounce of gold today has got to be worth or an ounce of gold in the future has got to be worth more than an ounce of gold today because of interest in other words you can earn interest on your gold for a month three months six months so the future contract has got to be higher it absolutely has got to be higher. The only reason backwardation can exist is A, if uh, if there's actual tightness, it's very difficult to get a hold of physical gold, or B, traders believe they're not going to be delivered their gold in the future. Those are the only two possibilities that would explain backwardation in the gold market. So with China setting up this physical exchange and the West using paper, right. <laughs> how does this affect the gold price? Well, what it tells me is that the price of gold, we're very close to, in my opinion, COMEX blowing up. You've got, the, you've got enough standing right now to take up what COMEX has to deliver. And I might add that they've only, only about half of, only about 100,000 ounces so far have been uh, not, I'm not gonna say settled on, but have been, uh, there's still 100,000 that's standing for delivery mm -hmm. that have not gotten their, their receipt. Why would that possibly be? All these longs, have to fund their account 100% by, uh, I think, November 29th or November 30th. They have to fund their account 100% in order to take the gold in. Now, the shorts who must deliver or are contracted to deliver, if they've got gold to deliver, they actually have to pay storage charges until they, until they, they notify of delivery. So why would they wait two weeks? We've only gotten half of the 200,000 ounces at this point. Why, why would they wait? Why would they wait to the very last day? That means they've got to pay the uh, storage charges hmm. up until it changes hands. It makes zero sense whatsoever. If you got the gold, you do it on the first day. And it used to be a year, two years ago, it used to be when there was when there were contracts standing for delivery, they would all be done in the first two or three days. They'd be done. The delivery process would be taken care of. Here we are halfway through the month or two-thirds of the way through the month, and we're only halfway done. So it, it tells me that, that there's a problem. Now, going back to what you were talking about, east to west, or I'm sorry, west to east, I believe that the, the east is going to price gold. They're going to price it in the physical market. And I think COMEX and LBMA are going to be relegated as unimportant. So if they're going to price gold, what are you, what are we all looking at here at the price of gold? Is it, are they going to keep it the same? I got, or we, I got to move my screen. We got, I got too much uh, sun coming in, sunlight coming through the window. There we go. So Sorry. if, so if, if, um, if they're going to price gold and the COMEX is 
not going to be worth anything, you know, uh, worth its weight in gold. W- what are they going to price gold at at this point? Are we going to keep it at the same or are they going to all of a sudden jack it up? The price of gold will clear. It'll clear on the physical exchanges. You have to understand if the price of gold has been suppressed, and I fully, firmly believe it's been suppressed, it's been suppressed with paper contracts. If it comes out that these paper contracts uh, default, in other words, they can't deliver the gold to, to back the contract, then there's no more suppression. It's like it's like taking a billion shares of counterfeit IBM stock and dumping it on the market. What would you expect for the price of IBM to do? Of course it's going to go down. Without the COMEX, without the L- LBMA trading paper contracts, then you've just got physical metal to clear. And we'll find out. It's a higher number, I'm sure. How much higher, I don't know. But trade itself, the trade, the, the buying and the selling, the supply and the demand, the physical supply and demand will end up pricing, pricing the metal. So, Bill, where do you see everything going in this next year, in 2016, um, with the economy, with what's going on in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe? Where, where do you see all of this? Where's everything heading? Well, God willing, we don't have a war. Because, obviously, geopolitically, it's it had been heating up drastically until last Wednesday, until the U.S. backed off. To answer your question, where do I see it going? I firmly believe that we're going to, at some point, we're going to go into a weekend and we won't open Monday morning. In other words, a financial crisis that does what what 2008 should have done. We should have closed. And had had we taken our medicine then to let the system collapse, you'd have a system that was on better footing today and actually growing but they've been trying to cover it and cover it and cover it. And the big boom that should have happened in 2008 is going to happen in 2016. So if everything is closed for the weekend and we come back on Monday and everything still stays closed, what is the everyday person going to experience? I mean, I'm an everyday guy working out, having my job, going to work every day. Monday, you know, comes around. Of course, the government's telling us that everything's going to be fine during the weekend. Monday comes around, and what do I see? Like, can I go to the bank? Can I go to the ATM? Uh, get some cash out? Is everything normal for me still? Or Every, everything will close. I actually, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a piece last year at this time of year between Christmas and New Year's. I entitled it uh, "Jack and Jill." You can find it on the Miles Franklin website, and it was a fictional account of how it might go down. And it might take three or four days, two days, for the Walmart shelves to be emptied. Distribution will stop, everything will stop. Going to your ATM, I mean, that's laughable. Unless you have cash in pocket, which I don't think we'll we'll spend, but for maybe two weeks, a couple weeks, something like that. I have no idea how long the closure will be. It could be two weeks, it could be a couple months, it could be longer. It's hard to say. Uh, to answer your question, if you don't have food and water stocked up, you're going to go hungry and thirsty. Because where are you going to get it from? So let me ask you, what, I'm, I'm just thinking about this. If When you say things are going to close down, is the government going to come out and announce that they have to close the financial institutions? Or... Do you think this will be a false flag like you were saying? You think they're going to go that route? It could. You could see a false flag, and that could create a financial collapse. Or you could see a, a, take an example, you know, one of the big derivative banks all of a sudden go insolvent. Like Deutsche Bank, you're looking at, what, 75, 77 trillion dollars worth of derivatives. If you get something that goes way offside, you could you could expose an insolvent banking system. The banking system is insolvent now, in my opinion. But you would you'd have something that would expose that insolvency. 
and then you get Bank A trading with Bank B and Bank B not paying because he's not getting paid by Bank C and it's around Robin. So everything everything just shuts down. It's it's where we were over the Lehman Brothers weekend mm. back in 2008. And they admit we were just two or three hours away from the whole system collapsing. And I would ask you, what have they done since 2008 to prevent that from happening or fix what was going on? And the answer is they've done nothing. What they've done is they've pushed the policies that put us there in the first place but they've pushed them in in much grand in a much grander way. There's more debt. There's more derivatives. They've printed more money. They've not done anything to fix the problem. They've only made it worse. Bill, thank you for coming on the X22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Merry Christmas. Sorry to be uh, so bleak just before Christmas, but it is what it is. Yeah, happy holidays to you. 